after several days and like quite a long time, one backer from three years ago gets their game shipped out. Yeah. And that's publishing on repeat over and over and over again. Yeah. And let's not talk about how many games don't even get played once. Cause <laughs> if I think about that, it'll make me really sad. <laughs> I do a lot myself, um, partly to keep costs down, partly because I'm interested. Sometimes I just, we talk about those publisher tasks. I just want to get stuff done. When I've got to email someone, ask them, chase them up, say, oh yeah, it's 90% there, but could you just tweak this one thing? And that process can take days. I like to just go, I want to do it right now. And then it's done. And then, then it's done, it's out of the way. And, I, <laughs> and then I'll be free. There won't be any more things to do. So Ben, you've been designing games, you've been publishing games, you've been trying to figure out how to kind of live in the tension between the two. And I think that's exactly what you end up doing. You're, you're always pulled one way or the other. And honestly, a lot of the times the publishing direction gets pulled, you know, you, you pull that way more, probably because there's like 50, 11 things to do on that side versus game design, which is kind of a basic, you know, I'm going to design, I'm going to prototype, I'm going to play test, repeat versus publishing, which is like 75 new things to do today that you didn't even know existed <laughs> so maybe that's part of it but tell me kind of why you wanted to do both you know a lot of people they they think they want to do both and so let's talk about like going in what made you want to do that and then in a minute we can talk about what was the reality but what back, back in the day when you were like hey this is going to be super exciting and super fun let's do both of these things what were you thinking so i don't know if i necessarily started out thinking oh i want to be a publisher and publishing stuff uh but I knew I wanted to, you know, run my own Kickstarter campaign and I wanted to do most of it myself. So because it was a, a low cost campaign, it was for learning, but also I, I like to understand the whole process. You know, it's, it's helpful to understand how the manufacturing works, how the artists work, how uh, shipping works, how the taxes work. Like, cause then even if I end up not doing that stuff, I can still communicate with people much better. So even just the conversations I've had with my factory talking about, you know, die lines, understanding the margins, like what the limitations are on the materials, things like that is helpful, even if I'm not going to be, you know, running the machines. So I, I knew I wanted to do everything or as, as much as possible when I did the first Kickstarter. Um, and then I had uh, Ivan approach me. Ivan gets a bit of a shout out because he played Micro Dojo before I did. So <laughs> I I posted posted up the files that I'd spent the day making on Board Game Design Lab. I was like, it's been a long day. I said I'd do it and it's done. And then Ivan messaged me the next day saying, I've played it. I've got some thoughts. And I was thinking, oh, I haven't played it yet. <laughs> um, and then about maybe a year later, um, he said, oh, hey, I've been working on this other design, um, which is 99 Ninja, which is actually the one that I'm going to be publishing um, in just over a month's time uh and he said oh hey i've got this you know it's about ninja it'd probably be a really good spin-off for the game and i said oh yeah it, it's cool it would be a good fit but i don't know if i'm ready to publish other people's games you know i kind of want to do my own and i think partly because i had plans of being a designer publisher partly because it's quite a lot of responsibility taking on someone else's game and i wasn't sure that i would be able to give it the same kind of commitment as i would my own ones at the time so i kind of said like mm, i'm not sure i'm ready for that and then after my second Kickstarter campaign, which was for the MicroDojo expansion, um, I was feeling more comfortable with the process. And I was helping uh, Simon, Simon Beale, who designed Microbots. Uh, he actually, we do some playtesting together sometimes. And he said, hey, I want to make a, a game. I'm struggling with it. Can we do a bit of a brainstorm? And he said, let me show you the original design. It was a Mintin game for a contest. He said, let me show you this for context. And as we played that Mintin game, I was like, you know what, this is actually a good fit for the type of games that I want to keep creating, which is one to two player, head to head, a lot of sort of thinky experience in a small box and a low price. And so I said, said oh, maybe maybe we could work on this together. Like maybe we could actually develop this Mintin game. Uh, and it's something that I could take on and, you know, it would fit with the kind of games I think my audience likes. So maybe I could publish this. So that was May probably May 2021, not long after the, the Micro Dojo campaign. And then because of that, I thought, oh, actually, now I feel comfortable signing someone else's game. I'll reopen that conversation with Ivan and, and the other designer, Matt, and start talking about 99 Ninja. So I ended up signing two games in about um, two months apart. <laughs> and I think one super smart thing you did going in was you didn't try to do some big, epic, $100 miniatures-based game. I mean micro dojo fit in an envelope yeah. like it was as small it's one of the smallest games i've ever seen in my life and so you know that, that first that means you're not going to make a million dollars but i don't think you went into it 
you know, thinking that anyway, but the, the mistakes are, are now a little cheaper, right? If you completely screw up every bit of shipping, it still wouldn't be as expensive as if you screwed up 1% of shipping on a massive campaign, right? And so uh, I think that was super smart going in is, is learning, figuring things out. And that's, that's one thing I, I want to suggest or just advise anyone who is a designer wanting to get into publishing, start small, learn, grow, figure things out, because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's just inevitable. And and the cheaper those mistakes can be, the better. And so, all right, so tell me like what happened next. So now you're talking to other people, you're starting to sign their games. It's getting a little more real to you because now you're working, you're kind of messing with somebody else's money. Now it's not just you, right? It's not just if you screw it up, well, you know, you can look in the mirror and be like, ah, I'm disappointing in myself. Now you feel like you're going to disappoint other people. And I know how that feels like this extra responsibility. So tell me a little bit about that and then kind of where things went from there. Yeah, it was definitely a big responsibility. And I think originally that was why I didn't necessarily want to do it because I remember my initial thought was it's either, okay, if, if I put in a lot of work into launching my game and designing it and promoting it and it fails or doesn't do very well, then that's disappointing, but I've only really let down myself and, I don't know why, but letting down other people feels way worse than, you know, if it's just myself, I think, oh, well, I'll try. You know, that's a shame. Didn't work out. Whereas if someone else has kind of, basically someone has given me their dreams and said, please, can you go, you know, please, can you go make my dreams happen? And so it's, it's a real shame to, to let someone down once they've kind of trusted you with that as well. Um, so it is a lot of responsibility kind of taking that on. I think I was worried before I did it that it would feel um a bit pressured and you know then it starts feeling like work rather than fun and then you know you, you don't want to end up kind of resenting this project where it's like oh i've got to make this game work but i'm not really that into it um but actually i found that responsibility a bit more motivating like i really you know want to make a success of it and do the best thing i can with it and um in the end i find i, I found that the projects became quite personal anyway there's, there's quite a lot of in those games because um with simon we we got together on like a weekly basis to work with microbots and to talk about it and discuss it and share our ideas and share our confidence as well and decide you know one way or the other which ones which ones we're going to let go and decide how we got to that really end, good end result um and in the end that was that that kept me going and made it enjoyable yeah that makes a lot of sense one thing we were talking about before we hit record was how lonely it can be designing and publishing games. And so tell me a little bit about that, but also like from hearing you talk about working with other designers, it's almost like, well, well, there's somebody else in the room or there's somebody else I can at least get on a Zoom call with. We can chat about things and we're bouncing ideas around and it's not just you bouncing the idea off the wall and hoping it comes back. Like you're actually you know, talking to other people, which can be invigorating and, and less isolating. And so talk to me a little bit about just kind of the loneliness that designers and publishers feel. And then on the other end, like ways to not feel quite as lonely. Yeah, because I'm like really a, an extrovert in that I get a lot of energy being around other people, like being in big groups and things. And so talking to people and doing stuff like really get, gets my energy up. It gets me inspired, uh, but it doesn't always get stuff done. So you, you need time to, to kind of get things done as well. So you need that that time alone to just sort of, you know, sit down and, and get those jobs done. Um, but that loneliness I find I don't always realize, but I will spend like two or three days of just particularly with publishing, but also with the design, it's it's always there. So when there's a free moment, it's always, oh, well, there's always something to do for the publishing, or there's always a design to be working on. So it's always like, well, I guess I could be working on that. And I notice after two or three days, um, I find not so much that the motivation goes, but just I, I stop thinking properly. Like I can't think what it is I need to do, the creativity kind of gone, and I know I need to work on the next game, but I'll open up, uh, you know my rules or adobe illustrator or something and i'll just stare at it going well i don't know <laughs> and so having those like chats with people even just to like i'll schedule something to chat with i work quite closely with um with dina dina ramsey who does uh, the marketing side so i'll speak with her to kind of help start putting some plans in place for things that need doing that i can then get on with later um, i'll schedule a play test with someone you know i'll reach out and ask for a play test or um write to you and say hey like let's have a chat and get on the podcast so like having that time sort of with people again it just that gives you a little boost to then go back and i mean we talked for half an hour before the podcast and we probably come up with a week's worth of work that 
we could both do <laughs> out of half hour chat. So, right. Yeah. Another thing is, is I don't like being the bottleneck. So if I'm working with somebody else, even if it's just an artist or graphic designer or somebody that it's kind of not working directly on the game or on the company, but it's just doing something you know, freelance, I still, I don't, I don't want to slow them down. Right. I don't want to waste their time. And so building that relationship with, with, you know, I've got an excellent graphic designer. Drew is, is phenomenal. And I've got another guy named John that does a lot of other stuff as well. And I hate those guys ever feeling like, um, Hey, where are you at? Hey, like, Hey, I'm waiting on this. And so I'll stay up till three or four o'clock in the morning. If it means getting something done to be able to send to them that they can work on, you know, when they wake up a few hours later and get going. And, and I think that is also really helpful in moving things forward because if it was, if it was just up to me, man, there'd be a lot of days I'd be like, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. But because there's that pressure of not wanting to let somebody else down, you know, and, and wanting to kind of help them be their best, right? Well, that means I've got to do a little extra. And I think that helps move everything forward. And especially for a project that's really big in scope. Now, you and I, we, we have a tendency to work on things that are small, you know, small box games, low MSRPs. And I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's easier. But when you're working on a big project, or even just the company in, as a whole, which is kind of a big project ongoing, uh, it's nice to have those things that can kind of push you forward on a day where you'd be like, ah, you know, it's fine. I'm just going to take the afternoon off and, and go do nothing. Uh, and sometimes I do. And I, I bet sometimes yeah. you do as well, <laughs> yeah. even still with all the pressures. But um, just to have other people around, they can kind of push you forward. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah. And those kind of scheduled appointments as well, like, oh, hey, we're going to have a play test on Tuesday or we're going to do it on Friday. Even if the only time that week I end up thinking about the things we need to do is on the Thursday night before we meet on Friday morning, it's still like we were talking about, I've been working on design for the last nine months and probably eight of those nine months have been, I'll get it tomorrow when all the other stuff's out of the way. And with the publishing side, never out of the way, there's there's never never out of the way something else. (laughs) So uh, yeah, that whole balancing because design's like one big problem, which is make a game. <laughs> I mean, obviously we can break it down to smaller tasks, whereas publishing's like, oh, I'll just send that email and it's two minutes and it's done. And you can get like 12 things done in a day. And like, oh, I've, I've finished that email and I've pushed this and I've set up this and I've uploaded this. Um, and so like, it feels like a lot's got done. Whereas I can, um, I actually wrote down a quote. We were thinking about this. Um, it's, I'm going to say his name wrong. Taika Waititi, the, uh, the writer and actor. He, I saw a quote from him. He said, it's about writing. He said, sometimes writing is opening up your laptop, looking at a blank page on draft for eight hours and then feeling sad and closing it. That's still classified as writing. <laughs> and so that can be a day designing, but I don't think I spent eight hours on publisher tasks that's gone, oh, I've got nothing done. I've probably got about 10 little things done in that time. Oh, that's interesting. So it's much easier. Yeah, because to there's always another email. Things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with, with game design, at least my process, so much of what I do is literally just staring at components and I'm playing out ideas in my mind. I'm like either playing the game internally, just mentally going, okay, if I do this, what if, what if that happens and I can draw a card and I can move this, I can roll a die. Like I'm playing the game without having to play it. So I can like play test a lot faster because it's all mental or if I'm even in the shower or washing dishes or something menial driving, you know, like I'm playing the game in my head and that's cool. And so like no literal work was done. Like I haven't written anything down. I haven't cut anything out. No cards have been made or boards, but like there's still that mental gymnastics happening. And sometimes it's literally just staring at things. And then all of a sudden you have an idea. Like I had this epiphany moment yesterday. I was working on this this football game that I've literally been working on since the start of this podcast. In 2016, this was the first game that I was like really excited about. I talked about it a lot on the show. It's now finally going to (laughs) go to Kickstarter. I'm super pumped. And literally yesterday I was staring at the player board that I've stared at Un, unknown number of hours and I had an idea about how to make it so much better and so sometimes that's just the design process publishing doesn't work that way you can't stare <laughs> at an email and then be like okay now I figured it out like no you have to respond and it's probably going to be annoying and frustrating and it's probably going to be a customer from three years ago who backed a kickstarter yeah. and they're like hey where's my game and you're like hey man you know if you send me your address anytime over the last three years I would have shipped it to you yeah yeah <laughs> but but it took you 20 minutes to figure out who they were because you had to read the email, internalize, what are they talking about? Send them another email and be like, hey, which campaign? Because they said, hey, I didn't get my game. Well, you know, I've done I've done 10 at this point. So like, which one are you talking about? Like, oh, this one. And this is my back. And then you have to go to Kickstarter and like, oh, well, Kickstarter, it, it, everything's old now. And so not giving you that data. It's like, okay, well, let me go to the pledge manager. Okay, let me find them. Okay. Oh, you, oh, you never put your address in. Send them an email. Hey, what's your address? Okay. 
wait a day. They send that back. Cool. Now I go to the fulfillment center and be like, Hey, put this in. Now I got to do the little order reform and all that kind of stuff. And after several days and like quite a long time, one backer from three years ago gets their game shipped out. Yeah. And that's publishing on repeat over and over and over again. Yeah. And let's not talk about how many games don't even get played once. Cause <laughs> if I think about that, it'll make me really sad. <laughs> oh man. 100%. But, yeah. Customer service. And so let's, let's talk about that. So you mentioned you've got a lady helping you with marketing and doing different mm-hmm. things. What are some other people that you've either hired or are working with in some capacity so that you're as a publisher, you're not having to do it all yourself? Hmm. I think I'm, I do a lot myself, um, partly to keep costs down, partly because I'm interested, um, partly because I sometimes I just, we talk about those publisher tasks. I just want to get stuff done. So when I've got to email someone, ask them, chase them up, say oh yeah it's 90 percent there but could you just tweak this one thing and that process can take days i like to just go i want to do it right now and then it's done and then as we talked about then it's done it's out of the way and i <laughs> and then i'll be free there won't be any more things to do <laughs> but yeah i like to kind of do stuff straight away a lot of stuff i end up kind of doing myself which means i've learned a lot of different systems um artwork is not one of my skills so artwork i definitely um uh, I have a great artist that I work with um, quite consistently. Looking forward to working with him on, on future projects. Um, I'd say I rely on sort of distributors and consolidators as well to actually kind of push the product. Um, I also rely on uh, Meeple on Board Vanguard to do the licensing for the games in other languages. Uh, and that's great because they have like all these connections and things that, I mean, for them, it's a pretty much a full time job, right? So that's. If I was to do that, that would be a full-time job for me on top of all the other stuff that needs doing. Um, so, yeah, for licensing in other languages, uh, artwork. What else is there? I think that's pretty much it. The customer service, I kind of had myself. Oh, fulfillment, actually. Fulfillment is one. Um, that actually, not because of, I didn't find it too time-consuming, exactly. Um, it's more the convenience, because if I want to sell online for example people expect a certain level of service um, and because I ship from the UK but not living there it means I have to time that around when I'm visiting and and things like that and so as it grows that's um, a bit too challenging to do Uh, and the real kind of trigger point for that was that the VAT changes in Europe meant that just having a partner to handle that just made life so much easier than having to do all the registration and and more cost effective as well so um, I work with Satu in the UK um, Actually, that that relationship has kind of grown quite a bit from not just fulfillment, but they're also doing um, some marketing and things as well. Um, we're doing lots of things together. So I think that's everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice. Oh, Nothing I've and, uh, into. Animation, sorry. Animations and render okay. as well is something on the artistic side. Uh, so Alexi uh, Menado helps out with that and does a great job. So that's my, that's right. as we'd say, the team. You've done some like board game arena things at this point. I want to chat about that in, in just a little bit because I think that's another interesting angle we can talk about from a publishing side of things. But you bring up a great point. When you're when you're doing this by yourself, or, or for the most part by yourself, right? When you're a one-person publishing studio, which we, we are, but we're not. Like We're still working with freelancers. We're still working with other people, and there's other people on board. But at the end of the day, you and I are doing the majority of the work for these companies that we run. Right. And the good thing is you do learn a lot so that when one day, hopefully, you know, get to a place where you can hire someone to handle whatever it is that, that you either just don't have time for or that you just can't stand it. Um, but you can speak the language and you can say, hey, this is how we have done things. Here are the systems in place. Here's something to improve on. It's easier to edit than create from scratch. So that's nice. But then. I don't know. It's just it's such an interesting thing. Like publishing a, a board game is so different, I feel like, than so many other industries, right? You couldn't do this all by yourself most of the time, right? For the most part in other industries, you're going to have to have somebody else on board. But with board game publishing, you you don't necessarily need that. And I think that's one really cool aspect of the industry. I think it's also maybe why uh, a lot of people in the industry are kind of grumpy and we're all kind of <laughs> like overstressed and tired and, you know, having interesting days. And so maybe mm. that comes out online <laughs> sometimes yeah. a little more for some people than others. It's, but yeah. it's something to think of, but, but that barrier to entry is kind of lower than other places. You don't need a million dollars. You know, if you wanted to go start up a, a coffee shop or a yogurt shop or, you know, some kind of little, little tiny thing, not even like a big, massive restaurant, but like even just a small niche kind of thing, you'd still need half a million dollars. You know, I was looking at my wife, you know, was thinking about doing a food truck 
here in our little small town or, or doing like a little coffee thing or whatever. And it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars up front before you could even start doing anything. And potion games, like you could literally, if you wanted to do it all yourself, like if you had any kind of artistic anything or, or go out and find some stock images or whatever, you, you could go to Kickstarter tomorrow <laughs> and potentially make money, right? You could put very little into it and then still come out on the back end. Like you're probably not going to be overly successful, but but you could do it. And so I think that's something else for people to, to realize. If you're having reservations, if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, gosh, it's something I, I'm wondering about, I want to do it. You can. It's very much possible. It's very feasible. If I can learn it and figure it out and 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 do it, then anybody can. And at this point, like all the inf- almost all the information is online. Like between Jamie Stegmar's blog, between crowdfunding, books that I've written or edited and put together, 300 plus episodes of this podcast, a lot of them on marketing and business and, and that kind of thing. The Crowdfunding Nerds podcast, which is all about marketing and crowdfunding campaigns and things like that. So many resources. At this point, there's really no excuse that, or, or I guess there's plenty of excuses, but at least the excuse of I don't know how to do it is no longer an excuse. It's like, well, okay, we'll, we'll take the next month and just learn and listen and read everything you can, and you can figure it out. So that being said, what are some of the resources you've gone to to figure things out? Is there you know, certain websites, certain forums, not even necessarily in games, because there's a lot of business stuff that I you know, watch on YouTube and, and read online. Anything in particular you want to shout out for people to go check out? Hmm. Um, I think most of what I've learned has just been either through asking questions. So asking questions on usually Facebook groups is, is what I'm more engaged in because I don't use other social media that much. But uh, I think, you know, people tend to prefer Reddit rather than Facebook. You could probably find information there. Um, reading some books. So I read your books, book from Jeff Stegmaier, book from uh, Joe Slack as well about game design. And I think what, what helps with that is once once you start seeing the same consistent message from lots of different people, you start saying, okay, this is this is how it's done. These are the things I need to think about. Um, I find in terms of, yeah, because there's, there's two sides. There's the learning. I actually had a note that we, we could talk about, which is around like finding time for self-development and all of that stuff. Um, but I think when when I started on the design side and because I knew I wanted to you know run a Kickstarter campaign and try and sort of bring a game to life and sort of experience it, it was kind of all consuming at that point. Like you say, you know, take a month and just learn everything. I I probably got through about like 30 of the podcasts. Like it was on when I was home. It was on when I was driving, when I was taking a break from listening to it, I was reading one of the books about it. So I really like absorbed everything over over that time. Um, I'm still, it's taken me like a year and a half because I dip into it occasionally, but the art of design I find is, is really good as well. Not necessarily to learn about the business side, but I just find, I read about a page and a half and suddenly I'm inspired and I want to run off and start writing notes about a new game idea and things. So um, that's been a, a phenomenal book as well. I really recommend that one. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely a good one. Okay. So switch gears a little bit. Now you've been doing this. How long have you been in the publishing side of things? I suppose, well, May, May 2021 was the first Kickstarter campaign. I suppose I'd say it's about three years. I started in May, 2020, listening to the podcast spent two months working on a game that wasn't very good and then started work on micro dojo in august 2020 actually so let's say three years gotcha what have been some of the interesting things you've learned in that tension of designing and publishing making time for both you know figuring out how to how to get games designed that then you sell right what are some of the things that you've learned what are some like like maybe little anecdotes or advice you could share with somebody who's thinking about or, or maybe they're just starting out right they're just kind of getting into that anything you would tell them I make lots of lists of things I need to do because I find sometimes I'll have an idea. It's a little bit like game design, actually. I find the publishing side is much more, it's it's actually still quite creative work because uh, it's not, it might feel like, oh, it's just lots of tasks that need to get done, but actually they're super quick usually, or once they're done, they're done. You know, once I've, <laughs> once I've booked the freight, I've booked the freight, it's done. I don't need to you know, wake up in the morning and think, oh, I wonder if I could take a different route. You know, it's done. <laughs> Um, but a lot of the, the work I'm doing sort of as a publisher is quite creative thinking, how can I promote the next campaign? How can I talk about it? You know, where do I want to go with this? What should the next game be? In this? So it's a similar process to that design side, which means sometimes I have ideas at inappropriate times, like I'm swimming or driving or I'm out somewhere and you can't deal with it. So I, as soon as it comes into my head, I write it down and then it's done and then I can go back to that list later. Um, and those lists are quite helpful when I find I'm struggling with that creativity or struggling with that motivation. Cause I think there's, 
there's some days where I feel like, oh, what do I want to do right now? And I can work on a cool new idea or designing a box or something. And then there's some days where I think I don't, I'm not feeling particularly creative and I don't feel that there's much I want to do. So what, what can I do now? So I'll look down that list and go, oh, well, I could just get that done or I could get that out of the way. So at least then that's something I don't have to think about tomorrow. So this I find a helpful, A, for not forgetting stuff, but also for sort of being that motivation when I can't think what I need to do today. I can look at that list and go, oh, yeah, that's something I can do. No, I like that a lot. And also it can help you kind of get over the inertia, I guess is a good way to put it, like to get some momentum, you know, to do a little menial task. Maybe it's just an email and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I can do a couple more. And then you've done 20, right? Or, you know, just thinking about a, a game or, or a prototype or something like that. It's like, ah, I can do, I can do this little thing. And now all of a sudden you've got a little momentum and now you're, you're moving. And then an hour goes by and you're like, oh shoot, I've, I've gotten way more done than I anticipated today. Cause I wouldn't even feeling good. I wouldn't even feeling creative. Wouldn't even feel motivated, but to have a list of like everything and then just start checking it off the list. It's, it's a, you create a process, right? And, and where I come from, um, one of the greatest football coaches of all time is all about process, right? And he's won a lot of national championships. And if you look back on it, he's like, well, this is what we do. And here's the box that we live in. And here's how we do practice. Here's how we do preparation. Here's how this, that, and the other. And, and now all these coaches that have come in and learned that process have gone on to go other places, become head coaches, and they have the same process. And then now they're winning national championships, right? And so if you can just create something that that almost you don't even have to think, it's like muscle memory. Like you do it so much, you get into this zone. And if, even if you, you know, were half dead, that your body and your brain are so good at going through this process that you can still do it, right? I think that's hugely valuable in creativity, obviously in business, but also in creativity. Because a lot of times we think it's more like woo-woo kind of stuff. It's like, well, I'm just going to sit down, man, and organically, man, like the cool things are going to come into my brain. Like, no, it's not like that. Like, it's just, it's work. <laughs> Creativity yeah. is work, just like anything yeah. else. And so if you can uh, build some kind of structure, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of scheduling, right? Yeah. On these days, at these times, this is what I do. And it just, then I don't have to think. I don't have to sit down and wonder, what am I going to do? Like, well, here's the day, here's the time. I guess this is what I'm doing. I'm doing, feel, you know, whether I feel like it or not. Yeah. And so that's been super helpful to me anything else you've learned along the way um i mean that scheduling for sure there's like a weekly play test group that i didn't go to for months and months and months because i was working on publisher stuff uh and so my game design kind of suffered and it became a thing like oh i need to work on that but i don't know what i'm doing with the design so i'll maybe i'll try it tomorrow and then eventually after probably three months of doing this i got up the uh, discipline to say i'm gonna sign up i'm gonna put my name down on the list i'm gonna go and we had a play test of the game and I was so inspired again, even though it didn't work great. I had loads of ideas and I mean, it, it's not news if I'm, but it was almost a surprise to me where I'm like, oh yeah, who knew? Like playtesting stuff like does make them better every time you do it. Um, and so having that and like kind of saying, right, that's on every week. If I don't go Monday, it's not going to happen till next week. So I'm, I'm going to do it ready for Monday. Um, that that yeah, definitely oh, really helps. Because now we're, now we're talking about loss aversion. You know, mm. people hate to lose more than they like to win. And if yeah. you feel like you're going to lose a week because, you know, if you don't have everything ready to go for that play test or, you know, if you don't show up, whatever, and, well, that means it, it's a seven day loss. And like, I think, I think we can almost hack our brains to kind of to get in that like understanding, right? Well, if I don't do this, I'm going to lose something versus if I do it, I'm going to gain. Cause you know, if you go to the play test, you're going to gain some insight, you're going to gain some ideas, some inspiration, whatever, like you're going to gain that, but that's not quite as, as, I don't know, movement inducing in your body or your brain as I'm going to lose something. Even if you have to put some money on the line, man, like I've seen people that were trying to lose weight or trying to do, you know, had some kind of life goal and they'll, they'll put some money into it. Well, they'll have a friend or a coach and they'll say, Hey, you know, here's, here's what I have to do. I'm going to give you a thousand dollars that you're going to hold. And here's my milestone that I'm going to try to meet by a certain amount of time. And if I don't meet it, then you get to keep that thousand dollars. Right. And so, Versus if I meet the milestone, you're going to give me a thousand dollars, right? People are way more likely to do it yeah, if yeah. it means they won't lose the grand versus gaining. the grand. Yeah. yeah. And so it's something to think about. I like the idea mm -hmm. of it being yeah. a, a loss because mm -hmm. I think, you know, none of us are immune to, oh, I can do it tomorrow. But you know, when, whenever you're putting something off, you're thinking like, oh, I don't feel like it now. I'll do it tomorrow. No one ever says in their head, I'll do it next week. It's always, I'll do it tomorrow. So that idea of saying, well, there isn't a tomorrow because it will be Tuesday. And so if I miss it Monday, it, I won't get to do it till next week. I like that idea of thinking about, oh, I'm going to lose a week rather than, yeah, rather than losing a day. That's a really nice perspective. 
And so, yeah, I think, so anyone listening to this, if you can just find ways to, in a lot of ways, you're just tricking yourself. Either, like in your situation, you're not having to come up with something because that's literally it. Like if I don't do it this Monday, I got to wait till next Monday. So like, there's no, there's no hack there. That's just reality. But you know, a lot of times creativity wise, you had, you kind of have to fool yourself. You know, like when you set a deadline, it's like, well, who's the deadline for? Unless you're working with a publisher. And I guess if you are the publisher, that, that is it. But you know, sometimes we set these arbitrary dates and you you know that like anyone who sets their alarm 10 minutes ahead, but then they know it's 10 minutes ahead. And so then they're always just on normal time anyway, because they're, they're aware it's like, <laughs> versus when I was playing football in college, I know I always come back to sports analogies. But anyway, when I was playing football in college, our strength coach, who was like the guy, like he was the hammer for this team. He told us going in, he said, Hey guys, my watch is five minutes fast. If you're, if you're on time, you're five minutes late. And if you're late, I'll see you the next day at five o'clock in the morning. Cause we're going, we're going to fix that. <laughs> uh, that's great. And, and so now we, his, his name is coach Yox. And so all of us were on Yox time. It didn't matter what my time was. It didn't matter what my school Yox time was a certain time that was different from normal real time. But that's the time we were on. We had it created a new normal in all of us. And so, you know, if you can find a way to kind of hack your brain, hack your system to create a new normal that puts you into a different place, that's how you stand out. But that's that's nothing I've, I've been really thinking about. I've been reading and, and watching all the YouTube videos lately. In a lot of ways, success is is kind of easy because so many people don't do this stuff. So many people keep saying, "I'll do it tomorrow." And if you can be one of the one of the few that does it today, even if it's not good work, like even if it's mediocre at the beginning, you stand out over everybody else who's just sitting on the couch. And so, anything you can do, you know. And a lot of times, people say, "Well, if I don't like the, the kind of that idea, it's like if I don't have a, a couple hours to work on something, I just won't work on it at all." What? Can you do two minutes? Like to take ten steps. Is better than zero steps. It's better than laying down, you know, laying down. And so talk to me about that. Is there anything that you do that's just small, that's seemingly insignificant, but then you found over time has has added up to being something bigger? There was something actually when you were talking about that came into my head because it was right at the start of my, my game design journey. It was either June or July, and it was because of the podcast. And you were talking about the the Seinfeld method where I think you said he writes every day and he doesn't want to break the chain. And what I did was I printed out a little calendar uh, of, of the month. I think it was June. Um, and it was when I was working on this this game that d- didn't go anywhere. But I said, you know what? I'm going to do something on this every day. And I'm going to put a tick in that calendar when I've done something on it. And there were some days I did like one or two hours on it. There were some days I didn't do very much. And I remember I was out in the day and I came home probably about two weeks into this of putting ticks in the boxes every day. And I got back and it was about one in the morning and we were ready to go to bed. And I was like, oh, I haven't done anything today. And I was like, I just need to do it. And I opened up the computer and I opened up my spreadsheet and I wrote one line, which was, I don't know, stats for a goblin or something. (laughs) I was like, there, it's done. Tick in the box. Now I can go to bed. And that did not move the game design very far forward. You know, that wasn't the linchpin of of the game. But I needed to make sure that I did something when it would have been really easy to go, oh, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, that's not going to, it's not going to move the game design forward that much. And actually, when I got to the end of June, uh, I stuck up July on the on the um, on the wall, and I carried on in July because I thought, well, I've... speaking of loss, I felt like I'd lost those. I would lose those thirty days if I stopped. And I haven't actually lost anything because those ticks are are not worth anything. But there's this weird feeling of like, well, if I stop now, there's nothing keeping me going tomorrow. Whereas if you keep putting the tick in the box, the more you get, the more you're like, oh, I've built up such a good run. I don't want to break it. So that was that was amazing for for productivity. Um, that that really helped. Right. And I, I learned this from Seinfeld, but also from a 15 year old girl that was on a mission trip that I was running. And we're in Atlanta. We're working with the homeless. We're doing some cool stuff. And she had a Snapchat streak that was like 700 and something days long. I don't exactly know what that means. I don't do Snapchat, but apparently if you do certain things on the app, then it keeps the streak alive and they are aware of human psychology and they tell you, Hey, you've done this many days in a row and you don't want to break the chain, right? You don't want to break the streak. And we were on this mission trip and she kind of had this realization of, and this is kind of an interesting thing because like the first, the first day everybody shows up and I give this like orientation. And a lot of that is saying, Hey guys, wherever we are, we're going to be there. 
We're not going to be in our phones. We're not going to be worried about life, you know, this, that, and the other. Like we're going to be in the moment serving, helping people, doing the best we can at that moment in time. And, uh, and I said, you know, and I'd heard about these Snapchat streaks and I was like, even if that means you have to give up your Snapchat streak. And there was like an audible gasp <laughs> in the room every time with teenagers, they're like, Oh, I can't believe you would suggest because there's like, I can't lose the streak. It's like, this is completely arbitrary. No one cares. It does not matter. No one's going to hire you. You're not going to get into Harvard or Yale because of your Snapchat streak. Like nothing matters. But anyway, but by the end of the week though, it was so cool. This, this one 15 year old girl, she, and this is a little bit different what we're talking about. This is so cool. Such a cool moment. She, she looked at me and she said, you know, I haven't opened up Snapchat today. I had a 700 and something day streak, but I realized that I was so much more worried about that streak than I was about, you know, actually living life and, and doing the things I'm supposed to do. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool moment for a 15 year old. But, but I just want to point out the power of that. Like she had to make a conscious effort to not keep the street going. <laughs> like her brain gets so conditioned to be like, this is what I do on a daily basis. And now if you can turn that into something that matters, creativity, do, you know, anything that's productive and helpful and useful to yourself or your family or the world. And you turn that, like take that same Snapchat energy and then turn it into something special. Oh man. All of a sudden you become one of those top 1% kind of folks. And now you're making uh, you know, a, a big difference. And, and also it's this idea that volume negates luck. The more you do something, the less lucky you need to be. You know, if I'm only designing, if I'm only working on game design one day a month, I got to get pretty lucky for that to be a really solid day. Like I, my, my diet has to be just right. My sleep has to be just right. All the, all the conditions of nature have to like come together in this wonderful intersection of perfect, you know, a perfect storm for me to have a really good productive day versus I design every day. So, you know, that random Tuesday was a good day. That random Saturday was a good day. This other thing, all of a sudden, because of the volume, I don't need to be lucky. Like I'm going to, I'm just going to have more at bats. I'm more likely to hit a home run if I get up to the plate a thousand times versus five times, you know? And so I think that's, that's super valuable when it comes to publishing. Have you noticed anything along those lines? It's a little more creativity. Like don't break the chain. Does it quite work out when you're talking about logistics and freight shipping, like all those kind of things. So anything that you can kind of pull away from that idea though, and apply it to the publishing side. I think there's a, a lot that I put into publishing where I think like I, I put customers really highly to the point where I'm like, I want to interact with customers in the way that I would want to do business with that company. Um, so I say, you know, I try and run a campaign that I would want to be part of. And so that means the things that I find most frustrating as a publisher and that I hate is people that are unresponsive, people that don't do what they're promised or don't meet deadlines and things. You know, I like, I like to get stuff done and I like to push things forward and I like people that are communicative and I like to communicate. So giving those things that I expect back, I think, um, helps quite a lot. And so I try and, you know, respond kindly to customers, even though inside I'm raging, <laughs> it doesn't come out in the keyboard. <laughs> it just stays with me at home. Um, I try and give them like the best solution I can think of. You know, if someone says, Hey, I, I mean, someone messaged me and said, Hey, you know, I, I spilled a drink all over it. Can I get replacement? I said, yeah, look, I'll just send you another one. Um, and then that person says, no, no, look, I'll pay for it. And I say, look, it doesn't cost me that much. I'm happy to just send you one. And then they say, oh, thanks. That's amazing. I'll definitely back your next campaign. And, and that's way more valuable than, I don't know, charging them a couple of dollars for a replacement part and things. So I, I always want to kind of give as much as I'm able and give people a good experience. Um, and that, I think, at least from the feedback I get from people, you know, I get positive responses from people. I, I can see they're happy with the outcome. Um, it's pleasurable for me to, to make people happy. I, I like that. Uh, but also I think it's, it helps because it's especially you get a lot of backers through Kickstarter. I, I sometimes get messages that's like, you know, to whom it may concern and things. I'm like, I'm, I'm not a big company. Oh, they say like, could you please right. send this to your team? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll send it to the team. It's, it's me. I'll let them know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, signing off my emails as Ben rather than you know Prometheus game labs and things like that. So um, yeah, that personal, sort of touch I think does does make a difference and you were saying you know how easy it can be to get started you know there aren't really that many barriers to entry and that's because it is probably still quite a small industry and so as a as a fairly small industry it's nice for people to feel like they're working with people and projects rather than just buying a game and the game arrives and they play the game and then the game goes on the shelf and that's it um, that's probably the most important thing I think from that side yeah for sure I mean people are way more likely to buy something 
from someone they either know or feel like they know, right? Because you've interacted with them. You've had an exchange. You know, they're, they're aware it's not Prometheus Game Labs. It's Ben, right? I, I, oh, I chatted with Ben. I chatted with the designer. I chatted with the publisher. And they feel that like almost like a parasocial parasocial relationship, right? Where they're, they don't know you, you know, they don't know what your favorite food is or where you, where you grew up or, you know, your relationships with your parents or anything, but they feel on some level that they know you. And then they're more likely to buy, assuming they like you, right? They, they yeah. know you and <laughs> like you because you had a really good response to customer service. And I think that's, that's super important. And, and like you said, we have that opportunity that a lot of industries you don't have, right? It's just different. It's not quite as, as personal. Another thing I want to I was just thinking about, I want to amend the, uh, the Seinfeld method, which is phenomenal. And it's worked for a lot of people. It's worked for me in different parts of my journey. Another thing I heard Seinfeld say is that, cause people ask me like, well, still, even if you're like, you're going to sit down and work on something like still for the chain to continue to go, like there's gotta be something else. Like it, it, it's not magic, you know? And one thing he said was, well, whenever he sits down to write and work on jokes, work on his, his performance, whatever he has basically one rule. He can, he can do one of two things, either sit and do nothing or work on jokes. That's it. And it's okay to do nothing. Kind of like what you're talking about with the, the writers. Like sometimes you shut the laptop and that, that was, you know, for the day, but, but he can't, you know, check on his phone, check email, scroll Instagram. Like that's not allowed. You can sit and do nothing, stare at the wall, or you can work on writing and Strangely enough, working on writing is a lot more interesting than nothing. And so when that's the dichotomy, when that's the options, then your brain is like, I got to do something. You know, I can't just sit here and be bored, right? Boredom is is unfortunately lost on our cultures. It's lost throughout society at this point. You know, if you're ever in a moment of, of just a, a millisecond of boredom, what do we do? We pull out our phone. If you're standing in line waiting to, you know, go to the bathroom at a concert or something like that. If you're standing in line waiting to get a movie ticket, if you're doing anything, we pull out our phone and we immediately erase the boredom and our brains aren't allowed to wander. They're not allowed to figure things out and think. And so when you just sit at your desk, at your table, you know, and you just pause and that silence creeps in and you're just like, Oh, I got to do something. Like you get that itch. Well, if you're only allowing yourself to work on game design, to work on publishing, you're working on your business. That's the only options. Your your brain's going to default to that because <laughs> that's so much yeah. better than nothing. So that's another thing that it's got like a little hack that he mm. figured out. And, that, you know, I know I've heard Neil Gaiman. He talked about that. Like when he's working on books, he's like, yeah, writing is so hard. So I give myself two options, do nothing or write. It's like, well, I guess I'll write. And um, yeah, that'd be my advice. To anybody listening It's like, if you put yourself in that scenario, I, I'm not going to hundred percent promise. I'll, I'll 99% promise you, you'll do the work because it's, it's less boring. Yeah. I definitely, I think I need to do that some more because yeah, I, I, you know, spend a lot of time working at home and as, as soon as I get to a, a, like a stuck point with the game design where it's like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'll take a break and I'll wander into the living room and watch TV for a few minutes or half an hour or, and then come back to it. And yeah, some of those most inspiring times have been, I find I do, it does come a lot like swimming or driving because th- there isn't anything else to do. You're just there with your thoughts. And um, I think one of, I was really stuck with design for about, two weeks actually and I decided you know what? I'm going to give myself a break take a day off and I went cycling in the desert about a three hour cycle and I had to stop every about 20 minutes and get my phone out and write down some notes because I was having so many ideas and I think I scheduled about three or four meetings and I had basically two weeks worth of work in the space of about an hour because there was nothing to do but think about it rather than being distracted by the stuff so yeah that's a really great tip I think yeah so let's switch gears a little bit you recently put a game up on Board Game Arena, and you had this excellent blog post about it, kind of the steps and walking through all the things, and, and kind of at the end gave your honest opinion, which I was really, I really appreciated because you had some like, not necessarily negative, negative is not the right word, but like some very just honest thoughts about who should do this, why, you know, really have your eyes wide open going in. So tell me why you wanted to get a game on Board Game Arena, and then just kind of give me a, the, you know, the bird's eye view you know, and I'll, I'll link to that article in the show notes here if, if people want to check that out and kind of see step one, step two, step three. But why do you want to do that? And then kind of give me like a, a review as it, as it were. I think from, I want to do this probably took a couple of months, you know, of just trying to figure out how I get into with people. You know, you send an email, nothing happens. You, you follow the instructions of the form, nothing happens. And eventually another, I asked in one of the Facebook groups and someone said, oh, I've done it with my game. And actually there's a developer discord that you need to speak to rather than 
what the official channels were. So that was a big step forward. Uh, then I sp spoke to some uh, developers, got some quotes for it. Um, and it was really. And when you say developers, you're talking about people that do coding. Yeah, like right? coding. Yeah. I guess what we should we should have done in the beginning. What is Board Game Arena? And then and then let's talk like, like what what is it as a platform? Yeah, so it's an online platform for for playing board games essentially. But I think unlike Tabletop Simulator, which needs sort of Steam, um, and it's Tabletop Simulator is sort of you could say it's more of like a physics engine than actually a, it doesn't implement rules as much. It's just it's suitable for playing games. Um, whereas Board Game Arena uh, runs in the browser, it also runs pretty well on mobile. So I think it has a big advantage there in that it's much more accessible. Like people can play games easily without going, oh yeah, you need to download this software and find someone to play with. I think they've made that part really smooth. Um, there is another browser-based one. I, th I think it's Tabletopia. Um, I think there's another one that's, I can't remember what it's called. It's called like On Tabletop or something. I can't remember, but I don't know why they didn't get quite as far, but I think... Table, uh, board game arena has two pretty good things as well which is the matchmaking system is quite good it's quite easy to find a game generally and they also do turn-based games where it's a little bit like the old sort of play by email or play by forum where you you do your move and then someone comes back the next day and goes oh it's my turn okay i'll take my move okay someone else comes back and they um and i think a, a large number of games are played that way where people have many, many games ongoing, and they're just like, okay, I you know, check my emails, I do my moves for the day, and that's it. And I think oh, that's interesting. That so you can play in ten games at the same time, one move at a time. Yeah. So that's that's board game arena. Uh, it got bought by Asmodee about two years ago, I think twenty twenty one. But I, it doesn't feel very like it doesn't feel like a big corporate entity to me, at least in the way it operates and stuff. It feels a bit like a, a very successful kind of fan project that's just grown. And um, I would say it's probably the best place to if you're going to have an online board game that's not a dedicated app or you know running your browser on your website i would think that's probably the best platform to have it on because it attracts the most players gotcha okay so online platform now you've gone in you find a developer who i assume you're going to have to pay to do the coding to do the back end like it's not quite as as user friendly i guess as tabletop simulator because that's the thing tts Anybody can figure that out. It's just kind of uploading files and tweaking some things. And if you want to go into the coding, you can, but you don't have to. But I, I guess Board Game Arena, you, you kind of have to. Is that right? Yeah, Board Game Arena is, is proper coding. It's it's PHP and HTML. And they've got a development toolkit that you can use. Um, and they have like a whole bunch of kind of published functions that you can sort of hook into, like things saying like, this is how we track the game state. And this is how we track, uh, you know, certain things like resources, or this is how we do the layout on the... On, browser things like that um that's probably about as far as my coding knowledge goes with it but it's uh you need to be pretty comfortable with those languages and with coding i think to be able to do it and of course you need to be comfortable with game design because if you're implementing like a lot of board game rules i've realized are still quite loose um like when i try and write the rule book i try and think of how would a computer interpret this but to code something step by step you can have a rule that's one sentence that's actually very very complicated to implement so one of the things that you can do in micro dojos i'd say is super simple is there's a, a building called the stables where you pay a food and you can move one of your pieces two spaces instead of one that's it but to fit it into the game logic what it's got to do is it's first got to recognize that you have that building Secondly, it's got to recognize you have enough resources to activate it. It's then got to decide what well, I need to ask you now if you want to do this, because this is not a normal move. So I need to ask if you want to do something different, which means I need to give a prompt to ask if you want to do it. Then if you decide you do want to do it, I need to check that you've spent the resources. Then I need to say, OK, well, now I need to calculate all of your possible moves, which is different to my normal game logic, which is you can move to an adjacent space. Suddenly that that space grows. The way we actually implemented it is you take two moves, <laughs> you take one and then you move the other. Um, so all the steps you needed to do, whereas what a player does is go, oh, I can move two space instead of one. Okay, I'm going here. Here's my food. And that, that's all you need to do. You know, we, we shortcut a lot of that stuff as humans. Um, so having the, the developer also understand board games and board game rules, I think, is uh, is really important. It's not just, you know, find someone that can code. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then if you do find a developer they need to understand board games and like how that works. Cause that's not necessarily the same as, as other things you might be coding. Uh, okay. So back to my earlier question, how long did it take? Like you, you contact the developer and now people can play the game on their own browsers. How long was that? So the development probably started in August, 2022. 
and it no probably no July end of July 2022 and it officially launched on August 10th 2023 wow so a um, year basically yeah it was about two weeks before we had a working prototype it was about a month to have an alpha state which is when it's launched on the platform but it's not like listed it's not sort of published as a game it's like very much alpha state there's going to be bugs and only certain people can actually access it so there's people you add manually to the group or uh, reviewer accounts on board game arena and reviewer accounts are people that have like 100 games played and high ratings and you know they're, they're particularly dedicated people so there's not not many of them uh, so that was the alpha stage then the beta is when it's a bit more sort of available publicly and that's when people can submit bugs and you want to have a period of time where there's no more bugs submitted and the game seems to be running smoothly. That was probably end of October, early November that the beta was ready. And then by the end of December, we said, you know what, we haven't had any bug reports for about two or three weeks. We've had several hundred games played. Everything seems fine. Let's launch it. And then it was August by the time it actually launched because it was just... <laughs> trying to get information from the board game arena team, trying to get in contact. Um, yeah, from the end of December, I think I've checked an email I sent in December saying, hey, we're ready to progress from beta. Can you let us know what the next step is for releasing? So a lot of it wasn't even the creation. It was just sitting on G waiting on, waiting on O for board game arena's team to actually put it on the website and things like that. Okay, that that's interesting. Um, and I'm hoping that they're figuring out ways to speed that up because yeah, that's a long time, dude. But um, how many how many users are on board game arena? Uh, there is a number somewhere. I, it's some some million, several million. Okay, I can't remember how many. A lot it, of people. That's how many registered users they have. I'm pretty sure it's in the number of millions. Okay. Yeah. So if if a company, especially a small company like one of ours, is thinking, "Hey, I want to get my game on this platform," it could make sense because a lot of people potentially are now going to find your game, play it, check it out, and then maybe buy a physical copy, or maybe you know learn more about your company, get on your email list check out your next campaign, things like that. Are they actually buying the game on Board Game Arena or is it just available? Uh, no, it's just available to play. You can launch your game as a premium only game. Uh, and what that means is, so Board Game Arena has premium subscriptions where you can pay, it's not actually that much. It's something like $35 for a whole year or something. Um, it gives you certain features. It gives you access to stats in games, which is pretty cool because that's stuff that computers can do much better than you know asking people, okay, how many times did green move and things like that. Um, so you get access to a few other features, but I think the main thing you can do as a premium user is you can start games that are premium games. You can start a table and say, I'm looking for players. Whereas if you're not a premium user, you have to join a table that's already looking for players, which is not terribly inconvenient. Um, but yeah, so that premium means that Board Game Arena gets some revenue, presumably towards running costs and things like that. And so if you launch your game as a premium game rather than just a free game, uh, you get some share of the revenue from those premium subscriptions based on the number of hours people are playing. So that's one way you can kind of monetize it. So it's still not selling the game exactly, but it's a it's a way that you're you're monetizing the game. I got you. But for folks like us that don't have these big, you know, multiple thousand, hundred thousand copy game sold kind of thing, like we're it's really just for people to be aware, right? To people, it's almost like a marketing thing. Is that kind of how you were looking at? Yeah, it? I definitely. Saw as, as marketing more than anything. I mean, because because it's based on the number of hours that premium users spend on your game on the platform, and then they just split that across all of the premium games and go, okay, you know what, your game had this many hours, we're going to give you that percentage of the revenue. Now, Micro Dojo had a thousand games played in the first day, and it's probably about five or six thousand overall now in the last like couple of weeks. But a game is fifteen minutes with two people. Now, there's something like a thousand. Arc Nova games running at any one time, like concurrently, there's a thousand live games, and that's probably four players, and it's a you know one to two hour game. So the number of hours that's going to add up to the revenue, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be nothing uh, basically. So I definitely saw it more as a as marketing and awareness than it was um, uh, as as a money making type of thing. Gotcha. Would you would you do it again? Like okay, the other games coming out, would you put those on there too? Um, so the Microdoja was actually, the developer did it for free. Uh, I sent him some copies of the game, I sent him a few to, to share with friends and things as, as thanks. Um, but he said, look, I like the look of the game and it would be a fun project for me. So a lot of the developers there are, I say volunteers, um, vol you know, probably like a lot of us are designing games where we do it kind of for fun and a bit of money as well. Uh, you know, it's kind of both. Uh, so that felt like a good, like no risk way to try out Board Game Arena. Um, the fact that I 
didn't have any control over the release schedule uh, means it's really hard to justify spending any money because MicroDojo, the quotes I had for developing it was somewhere between one and $2,000. Uh, I suspect some of the other games like Microbots will be much more complex. Um, 99 Ninja may be more complex as well. So to invest, you know, a couple of thousand dollars in something that might not see the light of day for a year and you don't have control over links to your, you know, to your store, to the marketing channels, it's literally just here's the game you can play. Um, I think it's great for awareness, but it's hard to justify a monetary spend because you can't, you can't equate where that, how much, how effective that that money has been. So yeah, when you're when you're putting money into it, it's much harder to justify. Whereas when it's like, oh well, let's see what happens. Um, yeah, then it's it's much easier. So yeah, difficult difficult sell, I think. Gotcha. Um, if okay. if you already have a popular game, I think it makes more sense to then invest in it because you know there's going to be demand for it right. playing. Yeah, exactly. And almost a way to just give people who probably already have the game just another way to do it, right? Um, you know, Gloomhaven has their digital version. And that's another thing, though. I, I feel like Gloomhaven digital is more fun than Gloomhaven physical because there's so much stuff that the, the back end now keeps track of. Like, it takes it out of my brain and puts it on the on the, the game's brain. And now, you know, it's a little freer and, you know, flows better and it's less clunky and I don't have to go, wait, can I do this? Well, the system will tell me if I can do this or not. Like the rules are built in. And so if you have a game that's really heavy like that, I could see a digital version being more popular than uh, the physical. But yeah, to your point, if you don't have a certain popularity already, then it might not be worth the investment but it might be worth it just to figure it out and have fun, especially if it's a small game. Like you're saying, your game was pretty pretty light and plays fast, only two players. So anyway, some some things to think about. And like I said, I'll link the, uh, the article you wrote, which I found super interesting. And you you dive deep into a lot of this stuff. Like we're just kind of glossing over this topic, uh, you know, for the podcast. But um, I, I really appreciated how deep you got into each step of the process in in the the post that you you wrote. So I'll link that because there was not much information out there, and so that's part of what took so long was. You know, it doesn't take two months to ask someone on Facebook, hey, how do I find a developer? But it took a month to, you know, to find out that no one really knew. And then a month go by where I think, oh, maybe I'll ask again, see if someone else knows something. And, you know, all of that kind of waiting, I hoped I could help other people kind of shortcut that. Yeah, gotcha. Well, cool, man. Well, I appreciate you, you sharing about that. So switching gears, let's go back kind of into that tension of designing and publishing. Because like you're saying, that's this is now a new arena, so to speak, where publishers, publishers can do different things and, and more and more games are coming on the market that are hybrid. They kind of mix digital and physical more and more games are coming on the market that are digital. I can't tell you how many deck building video games I've seen at this point. Like there's so many crossovers now and, and now I'll watch video game playthroughs or reviews to get ideas about board games. I was like, Oh, that's a really cool little system. I think I could figure out a way to do that physically and bring that video game idea over into my world and make it a board game. And so we're seeing some really, really cool stuff, but Diving back into the tension of designing and publishing, uh, you know, we were chatting before the before we hit record about how the publishing side makes you feel one way, the designing side makes you feel another, uh, and just kind of like living in that, living in that tension. Any kind of advice as we you know come to the close of the show for people, things that you've learned, any other extra little stories or ideas, anything that you think would would help them? Yeah. You, you said that much nicer than I said it before the podcast. <laughs> much kinder. Would it, well, what did you say before the podcast? <laughs> I, I said I could summarize it as um, publishing makes me hate other people and designing makes me hate myself. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, but, but it is actually because all the all the stuff that's publishing, a lot of it is coming from external that you're having to deal with, whereas a lot of the designing is coming from internal. So, yeah, that's how I'd sum it up. But um, I think the only other thing I've noticed with, uh, as I have, less time to design. I think I was quite hard on myself probably the last year because I wasn't getting as much design work done as I felt I was because I wasn't really paying attention to all the publishing stuff I was doing, doing. And it was only recently that I spent quite a lot of time. I had a lot of focus time to just work. And I realized that, oh, it's not because I'm struggling to design or I'm putting it off. It's actually because I am doing lots of other things. It's just, there are all these little things that you forget that you've sent an email and written a blog post and uh, followed up with something and, and all of this, you, you forget all that stuff happened. When you sit and design a game, you're like, oh, I've done it. Like I've made progress. Here's my new card design or here's, here's why I've moved forward. Um, but one thing I've definitely done more of as that design time's limited, I st still get all those ideas that everyone says they have too many ideas and not enough time to do them. But I'm being much more um, strict about working on 
games that I'm going to publish or games that I think would be good to publish. So um, I've had this idea in my head for probably six to nine months of a, a roguelike type of game because I've been playing some roguelike games and it, it's going to be this huge solo deck building like roguelike game. And actually when I do get inspired by it, I kind of remind myself that like that this is something I'm going to publish and to, to work on it. And even, even if it did turn into an amazing game, I've got to find another publisher to launch it. And that's a, that's an entirely new process. It's like starting again from scratch. So it means now I'm wor- I'm really only working on games that I plan to publish. Um, and that's quite helpful, I think, because that that can help me focus on the, the game that needs to get done rather than, you know, I, I know some designers say they struggle with having a new idea and then it gets half finished and then onto the next one and onto the next one and onto the next. One. So knowing what I'm going to publish really helps um, helps me focus. Yeah, it's and for better and for worse, right? Because like, there's so many ideas I have. I'm like, oh, that'd be so cool. And I could do this and this mechanism, whatever. But then I, I kind of get to the business side of it. And I go, yeah, but I think 12 people would buy that. Like, it's just not worth the time and the effort and the money that it's going to take to go into it to make it even marginally successful versus working on this other idea that maybe I'm not quite as excited about. I'm still excited, but not quite as much. But it's like, okay, that's a much more viable product in the marketplace. And as a publisher, you, you're constantly having that conversation with yourself. You're like, ah, is, is this worth everything it's going to take? But I tell you what, man, something that hit me the other day, I heard this guy say that it kind of changed my, my perspective. It helped me refocus and understand, oh, okay, this is this reality. And he said, your brain is a supercomputer, but it only has one megabyte of RAM. <laughs> I was like, oh, dude, yes. Yeah. You can only think about one thing at a time. Like the smartest person in the history of humanity could only think about one thing at a time. Multitasking does not work, right? It's scientifically proven that you actually get less done <laughs> when you're trying to multitask than if you had just focused for a minute and done the thing and then moved on to, you know, focus on something else. You got one megabyte of RAM and that's reality and that's all of us. And so just knowing that now you can work around it, you know, and, and I've been thinking about that a lot lately and like that, that keeps coming back in my mind. It's like, I got one megabyte of RAM. I got one megabyte of RAM. Like I can't spread myself too thin because I'll get nothing done. I'll feel overwhelmed. And then I'll get to the end of the day. And it's like, what have I done? And the answer will be basically nothing because I was just too, I had too many things happening at the same time versus I got one megabyte of RAM. Okay. How can I focus that right now in this moment? What can I do? And just lock in and get it done. And that's been super helpful to me. And so maybe somebody listening to this, you're in the same boat where you got a million things going on. You got your family, you got your job, you got all this stuff. Hey, one megabyte of RAM. <laughs> like, what can you focus on right now to move something forward? You know. So anyway, that's been helping me a lot. I like that. Yeah, and that's definitely one I'm going to remember as well when they, when I'm trying to do lots of things at once. Yeah, yeah like your brain has the capacity to do a zillion things. Yeah, but it's it's got that bottleneck where you can only focus on one thing at a time. So anyway, Ben, this has been excellent. Dude. Any any kind of closing thoughts? You know, I'll give you some time and just saying to talk about you got some cool projects coming up. I'm excited for those and. Um, all right, but any, any kind of closing ideas you want to leave people with as far as that, that fun space of both designing and publishing games? I mean, I definitely recommend, I, I enjoy it. I like being involved in everything. I like seeing all of the moving parts. Um, I think it can feel like work. And when I think of it of work, it stops being fun. Um, and whereas if you just kind of do the things you want to do, like, you know, part of designing the game, I enjoy learning about doesn't sound fun but i enjoy figuring out the best method of shipping it's it's another game to play which is what's the best way we can do this um so i would recommend like at least trying it and trying not to see it as boring work like see it as i mean i guess it popped into my head when you were talking about you know this cool idea that maybe 12 people would buy like sometimes it doesn't feel like fun because you're saying well i want to work on the thing i find fun right now which is working on this game that no one's going to buy versus the thing that might feel less fun which is getting the game done that's going to sell but it's a lot more fun selling a thousand copies of a game than selling 12 of a game. So <laughs> it might feel fun to design it right now, but it's really fun when everyone buys it and they message you saying how much they love the game and how they play it with their family and how their kids always beat them at it. And that is, that is fun. So that is, that is worth all of it. Yeah. That's a great point. Having that vision, that long-term idea of like where this is leading versus my momentary, you know, I'm a three-year-old, I want it now mentality, right? Which a lot of times we just kind of default to that selfish, oh, this makes me feel good, so I'm going to do it now. It's like, yeah, but that's not the best, you know, <laughs> and we know that, like that's common sense, but to take a step back and go, okay, let me go do another play test of this game that I know is a little bit broken, but I know it's the better product. Like 
and you just got to lock in and get it done, even though that shiny object is is calling to you from across the room. It's like, oh, that, that's that's just part of it, man. It's just part of it. Well, like I said, you got some cool projects in the works. Tell me, I think you got a game that's it's still in the Pledge Manager, and you got another game launching soon. Tell me about all that stuff. Uh, yeah, Microbots uh, funded in March. Actually, the Pledge Manager closes. If I say today, that doesn't make sense because the podcast is going to go out later. So let's say it's closed. Um, 99 Ninjas launching on 2nd of October. Uh, I had a brilliant idea to launch it whilst Essen's going on. So it launches at midday on the 2nd of October. And then at 6 a.m. on the next day, I'd start driving to Essen. So um, that's going to be a fun week. <laughs> be nice and busy. Um, and that's by uh, Ivan Alexiev and Matt Ding. So that's a game that I've signed from other publishers that we've been working on. Uh, sorry, other designers that I'm publishing that we've been working on for the last year. Uh, and then my plan is for Micro Midgard to come out in May next year, because I'd like to do a micro game May thing and have other designers uh, launch micro games in May as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. I'll start encouraging people to work on their designs now. And actually, that should be my final thoughts, which is for, <laughs> for people to start working on micro games to launch next May. And we'll try and try and make micro game May. No, that sounds good, man. And be cool to have you back on the show too, around that time. We can talk about micro games. We can kind of get it out there and say, hey, we got this cool thing going on. Yeah. Uh, maybe we do a end of end of April or early May show. That'd be really cool to bring you back and, and chat about that. Yeah, ben, cool. man, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah.